We've been on this series. This is called Jesus First Sermon. Everybody say Jesus First Sermon. Jesus first sermon. This has been Jesus First Sermon, and we're on part six. So this is the sixth week that we've de- been discussing only three chapters of the Bible. So if you find that very interesting, uh, when you read the Bible slowly and you really take time to consider what's being said, uh, you know, look at us. You know, we're, we're on week six of only three chapters. We're getting, we're on the third chapter now. We're on Matthew chapter seven now. Yes. We wrapped up Matthew chapter six last week. Um, and if you remember, in fact, we can read it real quick. But if you remember, our main point last week was Matthew chapter six, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's around where we ended last week that we're to be seeking God's kingdom first. Amen. That is the priority, Amen. that we seek God's kingdom first, because we know that this mortal vessel that we live in has a time limit, and we're to be preparing for the life that is to come. Amen. So we seek first God's kingdom, not all the other distractions. Life is full of a lot of distractions. Yes, uh, yeah. They have increased immensely since phones were created, yeah. since TVs were created. Before that time, um, you still had distractions. You had brothels. You had, you know, uh, business, just like there's always been, you know, getting rich. You had war, you know, going to war with people, yeah. you know. So there's always been distractions from seeking first the kingdom. But now it seems that we have this distraction just forever in our pocket at all times, yeah ready to get our mind on God knows what, and oftentimes it's not the Bible. And so it's important that we remember Jesus' words, that we seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, that living righteously, that loving your neighbor is really what matters. It really is what matters. Treating other people well is what matters. You know, seeing an orphan or the fatherless or a foster child and seeing them in need of a family and providing it. Seeing uh, a a mother who wants to terminate her pregnancy and offering to adopt the baby. You know, love thy neighbor is what really ends up mattering. And if you notice the devil who is the God small g of the world, not the earth. People sometimes misunderstand this statement. He's not the God of the earth. He's the God of the world. The world is a system. The world is an experience. It is a kingdom. And he's the God of that. And what he does is he says, no, don't trouble yourselves with the troubles and sufferings of humanity. Ignore them. Be indifferent to the sufferings of humanity. Or even better, cause them. Cause the sufferings. Right? And as Christians and as followers of Jesus... Our duty is to seek first the kingdom, God's kingdom, not the worldly kingdom, and God's righteousness, living righteously the way that pleases God. Jesus is not a pass out of living righteously. You don't get to be evil now that you're saved. And I've watched that with Christians. Hey, because we've done some good, there's some good under our belt. I can be evil in other areas. I can be bitter. I can be unforgiving. I can slander someone. Right? These are, these are evil things. And we go, oh, yeah. You know, the Pharisees did that. Oh, we have Abraham as our father. You know, they used their status I'm a Christian or I'm a child of Abraham, whatever, to, be, to allow themselves to do evil. And I'm telling you, it's really common. And, and, you know, I don't have all the answers for all the things. You know, as much as I try and be a good mini shepherd serving the chief shepherd, I don't, I don't know a lot. You know, the more I come to know, the more I realize I don't know, you know. <laughs> but I do know this. I know that if you're a servant of Jesus, you're called to love your neighbor. Yeah. And I know, I know, I also know this. I know that if you don't walk in the gifts of the Spirit, I know that if you don't uh, 
believe in healing. I, I know that if you don't believe this or that from the Bible, whatever it is, honestly, it's your loss. But ultimately, what matters is that you love your neighbor. And that's where the brotherhood finds unity, is that we love people. We don't have all the answers. We don't have all the right doctrines. But we love people that are in need. And, and this is what's emphasized over and over and over in Jesus' teachings. While there are these other cool aspects and supernatural aspects, if you pursue just the supernatural and you ignore loving your neighbor, you are not walking the Christian walk. I didn't know I was going to say that. But people pursue these supernatural experiences. They do. They pursue miracles. Jesus said a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. They're pursuing this spiritual experience. I've got to feel God. I've got to, you, you get what I'm saying? I've got, to, I've got to experience it. I've got to witness it. And he says, love your neighbor. You, you'll experience all the God you need to experience just by loving your neighbor. That's what's really actually important. The whole reason Jesus healed people was love of neighbor. So at the core of even the supernatural stuff is love thy neighbor. Love people. So seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first living righteously. A real child of Abraham is someone who lives righteously. It's not someone who does the Jude chapter 1 verse 4 thing who uses grace as a license for immorality and denies their only sovereign and Lord, Jesus Christ. So really, I, I, I'm here to tell you that when we read through Jesus' first sermon, it's really practical. Amen. It's really practical. It the first thing he starts teaching is practical living for a Christian. Yeah. Repent, and then here's the way you should live. He doesn't go, oh, go live on a mountain somewhere far away. No, I'm serious, and just burn incense and make an altar and, and just pray all day. Jesus actually teaches this really brief prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't he? The Lord's Prayer. Our Father? Yeah. yeah. Our Father who's in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Super simple, powerful, but simple prayer because Jesus' focus in his first sermon is that you start loving people. I can't tell you how often Christians seem to be willing to get together to do two-hour prayer meetings to try and get this touch from God but ask them to help plant a house for orphans. Ask them to, you know, feed the hungry or go serve the homeless or, you know, help, help Ray and Susan Kelly on North Street or whatever. And it's like, yeah. no, let's do a two-hour prayer. I've been there, they're not I'm just telling you that, like, yeah. God is not looking for that. You know, God told Israel at one point, that he couldn't stand all their services and their festivals and their prayers. He literally said he couldn't stand it. Do you know that that happened between God and Israel? That he couldn't stand it because they weren't loving. They weren't really seeking first the kingdom. You know you're seeking first the kingdom when you're seeking out relieving suffering. Amen. Right? Jesus' whole mission on the cross is, I bear suffering. I bear suffering. Now you bear suffering yeah. on behalf of other people. But what's the world's pursuit? As much comfort as possible. Yeah. Oh boy, yeah. and, and is that not our default setting as human beings? Wouldn't you like to just be comforted and entertained at all times? Yeah, that's why we snuggle up under a blanket and watch our phone. Comfort and entertainment. Done. <laughs> right? And then we're ineffective because there's a lot of people who are suffering. We're called to go yep. and find the suffering and, and help. Yep. That's seeking first the kingdom. Yes. 
And so in Matthew 7, which we'll be reading together, uh, Jesus uh, addresses more of our behavior towards our fellow human being. Why? Because a lot of the suffering that we experience is inflicted by human beings. You know, you might be able to say, well, a natural disaster wasn't really anyone's fault. Of course, it, it is, according to the scripture, the earth vomits out sin. So when there's a lot of sin in the land, natural disasters come, which includes plagues, two years of tyranny and, and a disease. Why is that allowed? Sin. It happened to Israel lots of times. They'd be enslaved by Babylon or they'd be plagued by a disease. This is nothing new. There's still a sin problem. There's still a not love thy neighbor problem. Even the scriptures indicate in Ezekiel that the, the sin of, of, of Sodom, okay, the sin of Sodom was that they were full of idleness. Yep. They didn't help the poor. They didn't love their neighbors. All the sins they were committing on top of that were a result of that. If you're not loving your neighbor, yeah, you're going to be selfish with your money and greedy. You're going to be sexually immoral because you're looking for every pleasure you can find. Yep. You're going to commit all sorts of sins so long as you're not loving your neighbor. You know, why is abortion so high? Well, you don't love the neighbor that's in the womb. That's, it is that simple. We're not loving our neighbor. Matthew 7, starting from verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? What would be the log? I, I think it's just not loving your neighbor. Yeah, right. You're, you're concerned. Concerned for your own self. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're all about the cleanliness laws in the Old Testament. So you're real concerned about somebody eating some bacon. Really, a speck. But you're not so concerned about your own greed and how you're not helping anyone in life. What's the greater sin? Mm -hmm. Or perhaps you're really concerned with, I don't know, the unwholesome language that someone's using, which don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating swearing or you know, sinning in that way, but maybe you're real concerned with that. But again, what are you doing for people? I, I, here's something I've noticed. This, one, this will probably make some sense to you. People who don't have much to do, they're the ones who are always concerned about someone else's lawn. Yeah, it's true. Someone else's this or that. You know, the branches of their tree are too long, whatever it is. You know this, like in HOAs or in neighborhoods. Yes. Somebody who doesn't have a lot to do that's good and for the kingdom. They get real concerned with things that are not very important. Okay, well, we do this as Christians. If you don't get busy serving in God's kingdom and loving your neighbor and doing good for your neighbor and helping people who are in need and relieving suffering because suffering's awful. Even if it's self-inflicted, it's awful. Suffering is awful, okay? If you don't get busy with helping people in those situations, then you're just going to be consumed with religiosity, pointing out the faults of others, right? Pointing out the faults of others, pointing out the faults of the world, pointing out the faults of, of Christians. You're going to be consumed with it. I'm not saying you can't identify right and wrong. So don't let the devil trick you when we talk this way that somehow caring about whether something's sin or not 
isn't worth your time. It is. The point is, if you're so focused on other people's wrongs and ills and things, but the, the chances are you're just not busy enough for Jesus. You're just not busy doing yeah. Jesus's work. It's true. True. Seriously. Yeah. True. Now, there might be times where God uses you, right, to minister to someone who's caught up in a sin to help them. That's right. The scriptures even say you who are spiritual should restore that person in a spirit of gentleness. Right. It's important to help people who are caught up in sins. No denying that. <clears throat> However, that's when the Lord opens that door and it's not your full time job to constantly point out the things that people are doing wrong. But it's the point of you to get the log out of your eye, to focus on doing the good that God has called you to do, to helping people. And then what will happen is you'll actually have a little bit of credibility and authority to be able to help someone when they're caught up in their sins. You can yeah. start to point out those sins in a humble manner and help them. Yes. But our duty is not to constantly go around and focus on other people's lawns. Take care of your own lawn. Why don't you help your neighbor improve their lawn? That's the idea. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Notice he doesn't have a problem with you helping get the speck out of your brother's eye. It's just ridiculous when you have major sins in your life. Does that make sense? It's ridiculous for me to be concerned with some sort of outward minor sin that I just observed. When I've got greed or covetousness or adulterous heart or something going on internally that needs to be cleansed and addressed. <clears throat> Best way I know to improve your own character is to go and help people that are in need. Amen. You want to start to be a better person like Jesus? And that's not a dirty word as a Christian. It's okay to be a better person. We, we, get it that, we get it that we can't be good without Jesus. I get it. Okay. But what's the work of the Holy Spirit? To make you holy like God. Make you holy like God. Teach you and train you to do good like Jesus does. Amen. Okay? So start doing good. Start helping people. Stop being lazy. Man, it's so easy to just point out other people's sins. Why don't you go and start being a house parent at a home for orphans? Why don't you adopt somebody or foster? Why don't you, I don't know, just do something. Quit worrying about everybody else. Yeah, put down the phone. Turn off the TV. Unless you're going to watch Superbook, because that's a good show for kids. <laughs> I say that because we watched it last night with the kiddos. It's a good Bible show. <laughs> but even then, after you watch something like that, go and do it. Go and live it. Amen. Be about it. Verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. <clears throat> you ever notice how famous a lot of these sayings are from the Sermon on the Mount? Don't give what's holy to dogs. What's that mean? Sacred. If you have something from the Lord, understanding, knowledge, good things, and you have gotten the log out of your eye with the Lord's help, you know, the Lord has delivered you from some sort of major sins in your life. Not just forgiven, delivered too. You're not doing it. You're not practicing it. Okay. It's unwise oftentimes to take knowledge that God has given you and just give it out constantly to anyone anywhere because they'll turn and tear you to pieces. They, 
They don't respect it. They don't care for it. If God has shown you the wonders of obeying him and keeping his commands, but others don't see it, a lot of times they're just going to be mad that you bring it up, right? They're not receptive. So work on the log in your own eye. Start loving people. Start helping other people. And then as God opens the door with individuals, yes, you pour into them when they're ready. True. I, don't, I don't know if you've noticed, but when Jesus met people, he had all the knowledge and all the wisdom and all the things, but he'd just give them little segments, just little bits. Yeah. You know we all need all of it. But you just give them little bits that they needed in that moment. You've got to be led by the Spirit that way. You also got to recognize, and you'll know this if you work on the log in your own eye, to stop addressing people's little specks when they might also have some big issues, some logs that need to be addressed that are under the surface. See, bitterness is not something that you can typically see. Every once in a while it'll manifest. But it's not something you can typically see. Greed, we typically don't see each other's bank accounts. We have no idea. Right. It's true. I'm serious. Adulterous heart. You know, it doesn't mean somebody has to actually go and commit the sexual act. It's just got to have the heart. Yeah. And then they're guilty. Jesus said that in this sermon. Yeah. And so, when you've dealt with your own huge logs or planks, then you're able to go to a person and recognize, hey, this surface level stuff, yeah, it matters, but there are weightier, more important matters to address and to help this person with. And you'll lead them to just start coming to help you help neighbors. Amen. Yeah. You want to help somebody who's got these outward sins that irritate you? Great. Okay. Bring them with you to go and do good works for people that are in need and see if it doesn't start to cleanse them just like it's been cleansing you. Let's continue on. Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it'll be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. So here's the deal. Ask God for good things. I'm moving. Ask God for good things, and he will give you good things. You have not because you ask not. Sometimes the scriptures also make this point, not here but elsewhere, that you ask with wrong motives. And when you ask with wrong motives, you also don't receive. So then people resort to worldly or evil things in order to obtain what it is they were asking God for. Instead of addressing their motives for that thing. See, why didn't you get that mansion? Well, maybe one, because you don't need it. And two, there might be a lot of greed in your heart. And if God just handed all that stuff to you, it'd just feed that greed. You'd be worse off. Oh, yeah. So he's like, hey, I'm not giving that to you. You need contentment. And we go, forget contentment. I'm going to do this evil thing, right? I'm going to get involved in trafficking. Or I'm, you know, I'm going to get into an industry that's evil. Yeah. Or I know I'll become a politician. I'll just lie to people. <laughs> Then I could get everything I want. <laughs> Whatever it is. You have not because you ask not, but then if you do ask, but you ask with wrong motives, you still have not. There are heart issues to address. But when we ask with a right heart and we ask with purity, God does give us what we ask for. Amen. And he takes care of us. 
Sometimes I think our requests, though, are a little too specific. And you get disappointed. I'd rather trust God's will. And what I mean by that is, instead of praying, I got to have that house. Yeah, right. Right? With 16... Thousand square feet <laughs> and an infinity pool. Yeah, right. right? Instead of that, what if we prayed, Lord, I ask that you would provide me a safe place to live and Amen. to stay. Amen. And I'm grateful when it comes. Amen. Right? Amen. Instead of saying, Well, if God loved me, he'd get me a BMW. We say, <laughs> God. I need transportation. Can you provide transportation? Yeah. And boy, what if he starts with a ride from a friend? Praise him for it. Amen. Yeah. Whatever he provides, praise him for it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank him for it. Be content about it. God yeah. provided it. Be grateful what you have, what you don't have. Just, just like Your possessions you don't indicate how much God values you. He, he loves you no more or less depending on what possessions you have. But he does give good things. Amen. Yeah, he does. He does. Now, you can be specific if it's written. Then you can be specific. God promises healing. Yeah. You can be specific. Amen. You can be yeah. specific about healing. healing. But God promises provision, and that's really generic. That's a very general promise. For some, that was Abraham having tents in a desert that would one day be Israel. That was God's provision. Do you understand? Yeah. yeah. Was, did God love Abraham? Yeah. John the Baptist, for him, it was locusts and honey and a camel, camel's hair tunic. That was God's provision. A lot of people read those stories and go, I don't know if I like God's provision. I like the version of provision that rich Christians show me. That's what I want. And I'm just telling you biblically that riches really are not uh, important. Nope. Ask God to provide your needs. He will and be content with what you have. Amen. Jesus sent out his disciples and their first mission. He said, don't take a... a any money or even a coat or, or anything. Just go with what's on your back. And then when they got back, he goes, did you lack anything? They said, we didn't lack anything. Everywhere we went, people took us into their homes and fed us. And that's God's provision too. It doesn't have to be 16,000 square feet. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I'm convinced a lot of times that 16,000 square feet is to keep you from being a missionary. Here, stay here. In this 16,000 square foot house. Please do not go minister yep. in impoverished areas. Just be busy in your house. Yep. Cleaning that big house. Yeah. Do, do you work around so there? God gives good gifts to those who ask him. And we, he makes this point, even though you're evil, you give good gifts. Right? Yeah. Oh, newsflash, by the way, Jesus said we're evil, <laughs> which is true. That's our default. We're selfish. We will hurt others to get ahead. We are not good people. This whole idea that I'm a good person comes from the devil. I, that's fine if you want to think that. I'm not a good person. I'm not a good person. And my default setting, my nature is evil. If it weren't God for, for God intervening in my life, I'd just be getting more and more evil. That's what everyone does. Now, they try and present themselves like they're not. They want to think that they're doing but, the good stuff, right? Yeah, but they're doing evil. But God intervened in my life, and that's what helps me to actually, I've been forgiven of my sins, and that's what helps me to actually be good and to do good. Now let's read this again, Mama. Yep. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, listen to this. So God gives us good gifts. We give good gifts to our children even though we're evil. 
How much more does God do that for us? Okay, so how should we treat our neighbors? This is what he gets at in verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Do you want people to force you, force you against your will to be engaged in some sort of medical tyranny? Do you, do you want people to force you to take medication, force you to be injected? Maybe you approve of one injection and not another. Do you want people to force you to do that? Don't do it to other people. Even if you believe in the medicine, if you wouldn't want to be forced against your will to put something into your body, then don't force other people against their will, right? Do to others. I can't believe that's even something we have to discuss, but it's increasingly relevant. If you were homeless and you were on the streets and it was cold, you know, would you like a sleeping bag? Would you like a jacket? Would you like to have some shelter? You know, yes. Okay. Do to others as you'd have them do to you. Oh, but they're a drunk. Yeah. So are the rich people you like. <laughs> they are. They're all drunks too. Yeah. I've noticed the same thing is happening on North Street as North Turn right. in Potsdam. <laughs> it's the same thing. North Street and North Turn are the same, same thing. It's just different amounts of money. But they're both drunk, partying. But I'm telling you, we'll associate with the rich drunk before we associate with the poor drunk, which just proves that drunkenness has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Oh, well, they're a drunk. Oh, yeah, well, so are some of your friends. <laughs> so even if somebody's a drunk, if I were a drunk, if I was under the spell of some sort of right. substance, would I want people to be kind to me and help me? Yeah. Yeah. If I was hungry, would I want to be fed? Yeah. yeah. Would I like to have a warm, safe space to be able to lay my head and sleep at night? Yeah. Amen. Right? So do to others. If I were an orphan, if I were fatherless, if my parents were out of my life, would I like some trustworthy adults to be a family to me? Yeah. You yeah. should yeah, I want, I want family, I want friendship, I want fellowship. Treat others the same way you would like to be treated. Do you like having clothing, nice clothing? Yeah. I love One of the worst things people do, this is so terrible, okay? Please don't do this. <laughs> okay. Your shoe has a hole in it, so you donate it. Just throw it in the garbage. If you, if you really want to give to people who need some shoes, throw that piece of junk in the garbage and go buy a pair of shoes and take them to the shelter or wherever you're going to donate your, your holy shoes. People think they're doing something really righteous with their holy shoes. These are my holy shoes. I would like to donate them to the poor. You mean holy like religious or holy like physically? Both. It is true, though. Oh. We give our junk and our garbage. You, like, feel bad about throwing it in the garbage, so you're like, well, maybe this peasant can use it temporarily before it's completely spent. That's worse than just throwing it away. This isn't good enough for me, but it just surely is for you, peasant. That's worse than throwing it away. Your heart towards them is worse than throwing it away. Because you don't actually care about them. I know from my own house and from everybody else's house, we've got tons of pairs of shoes. Everybody does. It's obnoxious. Take some shoes that are in decent shape and give them to people. 
And shoes wear out on the street a lot faster than yours and my shoes. Yeah. These folks who are walking all day, everywhere they go, yep. shoes just don't hold up very long. We need to take what's good and give it to others. Why? Because he just said, you're evil and yet you give good gifts to your children. Okay, so since you do it good for your children, do it for everyone. The Lord wants us to know, folks, that love thy neighbor is really what matters here. This is what matters. And there's going to be a lot of shocked people who profess Jesus and they didn't love their neighbors. And they're like, but I prayed in tongues and I was in church every day. And I, you get what I'm saying? Like, and I pursued the spiritual things in the Bible. And I declared and I confessed and I did this and I did that. And I, you know, and I had goosebumps during worship every time. <laughs> Especially with Rich's voice, it's just so angelic. Every time he'd sing, you'd feel the presence. Sometimes I'm pretty sure that the goosebumps is the subwoofers that are hidden under the stage. Yeah, because when you're at the big churches, those subwoofers are powerful, man. You're like, wow, I feel God. And it's like, I think it's probably just the subwoofers hitting your organs. That's what you're feeling. Those things are powerful. See, we got to manufacture the presence, you know. Listen, I, I make jokes, but I'm telling you, none of that is going to matter. None of that's going to matter. If you don't say yes, when Jesus presents you with opportunities to help people, you are not on your way to life. Most popular sermon I could ever preach, right? If you don't say yes to Jesus, when he presents opportunities to help people, you are not on your way to life. You are not seeking first the kingdom. You will not enter life. Let me make this case because Jesus does here in Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 13. Okay, so Jesus' point before he starts to talk about salvation, what is his last point? It's verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And if you understand love, right, love is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Okay, and how could you define love? Do for others as you'd have them do to you. Treat people as you would like to be treated. And that doesn't just mean, like, emotionally, Like, oh, I'd like people to be friendly to me. Great. That's a great start. Be kind. Yes. Yes. Thank you for starting. That is the start. That is not the completion of loving your neighbor. If you've always been a jerk and you've recently become a Christian and you're feeling the sense to be nice to people, you're right. That is an act of love. But it's the start. People treat the fact that like, well, I hold the door for old ladies and and I'm nice to people. That like they're done. That's the start of loving your neighbor. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's not the end all be all. Okay, so he says love your neighbor. That's, that's, and then he goes into this. Love your neighbor. And now he's going to talk about salvation and judgment. I find that to be calculated. He's like, hey guys, here's a bunch of practical living. Ultimately, what I'm calling you to do is treat others as you would have them treat you. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Right? And then he goes into salvation related topics. Why? Because the two are tied together. You don't have faith if you don't have love for your neighbor. You can claim to have faith in Jesus all day long. You don't have it if you're not loving your neighbor. You don't have it because you felt goosebumps. You don't have it because you cried. You don't have it because you're financially blessed. You don't have it because you pray for two, three hours at a time. None of these things indicate you have real faith in Jesus. 
The first and primary expression of faith is love. Faith working itself through love. And so Jesus starts talking about salvation because he knows, you might not know it, but he knows it, you don't have salvation without love. Because saving faith always results in love. Always results in love. It might not result in gifts of the Spirit because you might not have faith for those things. It might not result in some of these other spiritual sides of following Jesus. That's okay. You're not a lesser Christian. I don't view you as a lesser Christian. You know, I'm reminded of, of, of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, actually, spiritually speaking, was like wrong on a ton of spiritual matters. The Samaritans were, they claimed to be serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they didn't do temple worship, and not correctly. Uh, it's true. And, and, and they did not obey Torah correctly. They were not following the law of Moses correctly. That was the main issue that the Israelites had with the Samaritans. But they were related and Jesus used them to indicate that even though they were off spiritually, they actually loved their neighbor, right? That's the parable of the Good Samaritan. You've got a priest and a Levite. These are two temple worshipers. These are very spiritual men. They were doing the right things in the temple, and they passed by. They didn't love, right? So they were very spiritual, but they didn't love. I'm serious. You can be spiritual and not be filled with love. Wh witches are spiritual. Warlocks are spiritual. Spiritual means very little. They didn't have love. But then the Good Samaritan, <laughs> not very good doctrine, not very spiritual but doesn't pass by and actually loves their neighbor. And Jesus was thrilled with him and, and he gets honored and praised by Jesus and the other two are forgotten forever. Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life and there are few who find it. So you have many on the path to destruction. These are all famous sayings individually, if you've noticed. Yeah. Yes. Jesus is, but when you put them all together, you realize, oh, this is all one thought process from Jesus. This is all one sermon. Yeah. These are not separate sermons. So Jesus is telling you to enter through the narrow gate. He says that it's narrow, that there's few who find it, that there's few who, say, who are saved. Why? Well, one, we get all distracted. We get very worldly. We pursue spiritual things rather than love. That's good. We do. We substitute love with spiritual things. If I pray in tongues all day, surely I'm going to heaven. Surely, if I'm going to church on the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, I'm a lot more Christian than other Christians because they go only on Sunday. And I go on the seventh day Sabbath, which God established in Genesis 2. So I am a superior Christian. Right? I'm more spiritual. Okay, if that's the thought process, first off, you're not very spiritual. And secondly, you're not loving your neighbor. You're not loving your neighbor. You don't even get the point of the Sabbath. The point of the Sabbath is love of neighbor. You don't force people to work for you. You let them rest. Because we all need rest. Because we work six days a week. So even that, the motivation is love your neighbor. Love your neighbor and love yourself. 
So we think we're being super spiritual and we're doing all these Christian things and we're so Christian. But boy, when is the last time you went and bought a nice pair of shoes for someone living on the street? When is the last time that you took one of those coats off the rack and gave it to someone when it got cold outside who didn't have one? When is the last time that you fundraised to do some sort of important thing for people who are in need in your community? There's lots of need. Pick one. There's lots of need. The Bible brought up orphans and widows most often because they're just always in need. So find a need and meet it. Amen. Then I'll believe you that you're serving Jesus. Before that, I just, I don't really, I don't care. I don't care how big your ministry is or building is. or I really don't. Like, that used to dazzle me a bit, you know? And don't lie, it dazzles a lot of people. Dazzles a lot of people. used to dazzle me. I know. It dazzles a lot of Christians. Wow. You know, and, 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 and our local pastors are just, they're, they're small scale versions of the televangelists. They just make less money, but it's the same thing. Look at how blessed I am. Yeah. <laughs> I know a local pastor who went and, because uh, there was a, I knew a gentleman who was a dealer at the car dealership. And he walked in, he's got a big church. He walked in and he just bought cash for himself like an $80,000 truck. What? Just walked in, what? 80 grand cash, man, just bought, man. Now, it's between him and God, whether that was appropriate or not. But all I know is that you could get a truck for a lot less if you like need a truck and help people with the remaining amount. What if you bought like you know, what if you bought a $20,000 truck, right? Right? And then you bought six $10,000 cars for some families in need in your church. I don't know. It's a different way of thinking, isn't it? But as long as we go, you know, the truck is my blessing. God has blessed me with this 80,000. See, as long as you're the disciple whom after Jesus has multiplied the loaves and fishes and you go, wow, my five loaves and two fish, right? Became 10,000 loaves and fishes. And you go, it's for me. Then you're not going to share. Because your five loaves and two fishes multiplied into 10,000. And it was God who did it. Wow, it was divine how that Money multiplied. Yeah. But then you keep it for yourself. You haven't done anything that's love of neighbor. You haven't fulfilled love of neighbor. You just loved yourself some more. Love thyself. I just, I just wish some of these guys would just go and start corporations and just do what they have a skill to do. Just go sell a product. Just sell a product. You're good at it. You're, you're good at selling a product. You're good at motivating people to buy in on what it is you're doing. You know, you'd be great at doing like a, a startup or an IPO and getting people on board. Not so great as a pastor. Folks, we need to take a real inventory of ourselves, of our leadership, of our churches, of our money and decide, are we on the pathway to destruction? Are we just like everybody else, pretty much? Well, worldly people can buy $80,000 trucks, so God's child should be able to. Is this not how we talk? Am I not a child of God? Was John the Baptist a child of God? It's a narrow path. If it's exactly the same as what the world is doing, it is not the narrow path. It's not the narrow path. The building fund to have an even bigger building that sits empty six days a week is not the narrow 
path. Go start a corporation. You can build buildings. It'll feel good. Amen. I'm sure it feels great to accomplish sure. building a building. That's great. Rock and roll. Knock yourself out. Start a corporation. Stop pastoring and start a corporation. Well, the church, though, is tax exempt. So it's nice to have no tax when you build your buildings and you buy your vehicles. Dude. Sometimes I think these guys don't think there's a God. It's possible that some of these guys are not even Christians and they don't think there's a God. They just know that, you know, the business model's tax exempt and people will give and they can live like a corporate guy without the taxes. Cool. Cool. And I think the proof of that is that the churches aren't giving like they ought to be giving. I am nobody. Look at the size of my church. And we've raised over $100,000 to build more homes for orphans Amen. just in this last Amen. end of the year. That's right. So yeah, I'm going to build some buildings. Not just for me. Amen. I'm just an overseer and a caretaker. And I'm nobody. And I have like no resources except God who tends to provide everything we need. But these guys with a lot of resources, they could do so much more than me. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Seriously. They got a thousand people in their church. They got regular income and they can put on fundraisers and they just don't. This is what I want you to understand. They just don't. And if they do, it's always a minuscule percentage. So at the end of the year, when they give their annual report, they're able to tell everybody that, look, we fed some kids in Africa and I bought an $80,000 truck. See, here's what makes it disingenuous. Look at the percentages. That's what makes it disingenuous. 90 something percent to salaries. That's where the majority of church money goes. Yeah, we knew a worship leader at one of the big churches here in our area that it was like his, his salary was, I think, 80, yeah, $80,000. That's a lot of money. Ooh. It's 80 grand. Whoa. I'm God's child. God's child. I don't know. God has like cut my pay multiple times as I serve him. <laughs> to trust so him. I yeah, right. Christ. So I don't know where this idea of like, I have to be a millionaire because I am God's child, comes from. It deserves to be mocked. It's nonsense. It's not Christian culture. It's worldly culture yeah. pretending to be Christian culture. We're just stamping Jesus on worldliness. I have way more respect for Jeff Bezos just being honest what he is. I'm a filthy rich businessman. Great. Thank you for being honest. God can work with that. God can work with that. Yes. But these Christians who are like, no, I'm very generous. I gave 1% of my income. 1%. I helped the poor. Our church gave 2%. It's really sad. It is really sad. Very sad. Rich, can you preach on something else? No, because no. it matters. Truth. It really does matter. God's not pleased with it. Verse 15, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Ravenous, consuming. They consume. Ah, consume. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. As long as you think the fruits are long prayer services, yeah. you know what I'm saying, Alter preaching sermons, as long as you think those are the fruits, you're going to get totally tricked. Yeah. Let me tell you something about the wolf and the sheep. They both preach, they both pray, yep. 
They both gather for church. They both talk about morality. So these are not the indicators. You realize that? The bad guys preach sermons too. I, hello. <laughs> Caiaphas was the head of the temple yeah, that's right. and he murdered Jesus. The yeah. bad guys preach too. The bad guys pray too. What is the fruit that you can actually pay attention to? It's something visible. I want you to understand this. It's visible. It's visible. How luxurious is their life? How luxurious? I'm not saying needs shouldn't be met. I'm saying how luxurious. What did Satan offer Jesus? All the kingdoms, all the riches, didn't he? All the kingdoms, all the riches. So we've got John the Baptist and we've got Jesus and we've got the early apostles and we've got them all selling possessions and giving possessions, not accumulating possessions. Would you say that that is an observable fruit? Yes. Look for the givers. Those are shepherds. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying you have to know the amounts they're giving, but you can tell. You can tell. Based on how luxuriously they're living. Are they living modestly? Or are they pretending to be modest, but really they're just pursuing being a corporate guy just like any, anyone in the world, and they want to be wealthy, and they want to have lots of things, and they want a perfect house with perfect expensive furniture and perfect cars and perfect family photos. Yeah. Perfect. I'm just telling you. See, the fruit is actually observable and it's whether they're accumulating or not. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? So if somebody's trying to gain the world, they are not your shepherd. They are not serving the shepherd. They should not be a shepherd in your life. Yeah. It's that simple. But they got some good doctrines on some things. Just read the Bible for yourself. Listen to a different shepherd who isn't living greedily. We do try and dress up our greed, but it's still greed. Wow. Well put. So every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Amen. I think by this point in the sermon, the crowd was probably like, uh, Jesus, could we go back like to the like, blessed are the merciful, like where you started, like the beatitudes. Can we go back to that? Because now he's going into salvation. Yes. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Those are all spiritual things, aren't they? Aren't they? They're all the, pro they're all the spiritual side of Christianity, aren't they? Prophesying, casting out demons, performing miracles. You know, that, you know the disciples and, the, and Jesus, they all did that stuff. Problem is, these kinds of Christians, that's what they're pursuing. They're pursuing this spiritual experience. They're not pursuing their neighbor being relieved of suffering. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
You people who are pursuing spiritual things, but you're not actually looking to love your neighbor, the whole law and the prophets hangs on these, to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. There's no commandment greater than these. You can even summarize it down to just love your neighbor. Why could you do that? Because Jesus says, whatever you do for the least, you've done for me. So you're loving God if you're loving your neighbor. So love your neighbor as yourself. You want to be a good Christian? Yes, I want to be a good Christian. Thank you. Good. I'm glad. Amen. Love your neighbor. I don't care if you get the rest wrong. I really don't. Good, the, the Good Samaritan pretty much... I'm serious. The Good Samaritan was pretty much wrong on everything else. Yeah. All right, so you're wrong. You don't have the best orthodoxy. Yeah. Great. Do you love your neighbors? Amen. Yep. Okay, good. God will sort the rest out. He'll sort the rest out. We'll all have the right doctrine once we get to heaven. It'll all be okay. What matters right now is loving your neighbor. This goes for me too. I like to be right. You know what's right? Love your neighbor. The more I try and get like right on everything else that's in there, the more I realize, oh, there's a lot of complications and it's not so easy. But love your neighbor. I can, I can understand that. I can teach that. I can practice that. I know every Christian can do that. I know that Jesus has commanded it of every Christian. You know, not everything in the Bible is for every Christian. Jesus said, you know, some people are eunuchs who are born that way. Some people are eunuchs because they're made that way by others. Some people choose to be eunuchs for the kingdom of God. And some people get married and have kids. His point was, in, in, in these other areas, there's going to be differences in levels. There's the, the, the body has different functions and different parts, and it does different things. But what the whole body is called to do is to love their neighbor. And to use the whole body and each of its talents and strengths to love yep. effectively as one church. Maybe you're really good at working hard to make money. So you're the financer. Right. You're the angel investor in what God is doing. You give. Amen. You go to work 60 hours a week so that you can pay for the people who are the ones maybe living among those who are suffering. Okay, yeah. that's fair enough. That's fine. That's cool. Amen. God called you to that. Yep. Maybe you don't make a lot of money, but you are really hosp hospitable. Yeah. Maybe you're an excellent chef. All right, so you cook the food. Maybe you're strong. Okay, so you lift up the tables and the chairs, so to speak, or it, physically. Yeah. You build the houses. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is what it means to be a body of Christ working together. Amen. But the goal for everybody is love thy neighbor. We're so concerned about like, what are gender roles? And do you speak in tongues? And God is concerned with, God is concerned with, are you loving your neighbor? I'll sort the rest out. I'll sort it out. Amen. All right. Let's wrap this up. Are you guys receiving something? Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. I'm receiving something Let's wrap this up. Amen. So it's not just people who say, Lord, Lord, is it? It's people who actually obey Jesus and Jesus' royal law. Amen. This is my command. Yep. Love each other as I have loved you. That's what he says. Yes. Amen. Matthew 7. We're going to wrap it up. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. In other words, we better pay attention to what he's saying. We better act on his words. This is where he ends. 
He says, love your neighbor. Not everyone who calls me Lord will be saved. Do what I say. That's literally how he ends this sermon. Yep. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Not everyone who calls me Lord is going to be saved. Right. Do what I say. Amen. Yeah. Do you see that? That's what, yeah. Those were the last yeah. three points he made. Yeah. Do to others as you'd have them do to you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, is going to enter in. Those yeah. super spiritual people who appear to be entering in are not entering in because they don't love their neighbors. They're lawless. The law and the prophets hang on this. Love your neighbor. Yeah. So they're lawless if they're not loving their neighbor. You know, the, the Pharisees that passed by the Good Samaritan, the, the priest and the Levite, you know, they didn't eat pork, you know. They held to those cleanliness laws. They held to the kosher laws. But they passed by. They're lawless. And the Samaritan, who might have eaten pork from time to time, they had wrong doctrines on all, all sorts of things. He might have eaten pork from time to time. He loved his neighbor, and Jesus was pleased with him. He'll sort out the other doctrines. He just wants to make sure you get this one right. Love your neighbor. We don't have a lot of time. I'm going to close with this, okay? We don't have a lot of time, do we? You can tell as you get older, you realize, I, I notice, and I'm only 33, I, there's not a lot of time. There's just not a lot of time. So if there's not a lot of time for you to spend lots of time to get everything written right, get one thing right love. what do you need to get right? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Believe in Jesus yeah. and love your neighbor as he's yeah. commanded. Why? Because he said, he ends his, his first sermon with, all right, love your neighbor. Uh, not everybody who calls me Lord is going to go to heaven. And uh, please obey me. Yes. Because that determines whether you will stand or fall. Right. And what do we need to obey him on? Well, the first thing I said, love your neighbor. So that's the question for you, Christian. Maybe you're not getting everything right. Thank God for his mercy. You know, we should, our behavior will improve as we serve the Lord. But you know what? The first behavior that matters is, is what you're doing for others that are suffering Amen. and in need. And not being someone who's causing the suffering. Right. Stop perpetuating it. Yeah. Not helping, that perpetuates suffering. Being bitter, that perpetuates suffering. Do doing evil to people, that perpetuates suffering. Do Listen, if these words come out of your mouth, well, I got to get here and I got to do this and I got to accomplish this. And I, I, me, me. I need these shoes. I need that car. I need that house. I need this. I need that. Yeah. You are not loving your neighbor. You are loving yourself. Loving yourself. And Jesus says, all right, stop that. Yeah. I'll take care of you. You love your neighbor. Amen. That is is the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount. Amen. For six weeks, we've read practical advice from Jesus on how to live. Yep. And commandments, not just advice. Commandments. Yes. And he's commanded us for six weeks, in one way or another, to love our neighbor. Yep. And then he ends his sermon with, hey, I really meant it. And if you don't do it, you won't be saved. So, Christian, what matters when you leave here? Well, I'll tell you. Sure, the Sabbath is in the Bible and matters. Sure, understanding marriage and gender roles matters. Sure, understanding the gifts of the Spirit matters. It's all in the Bible. But what's exceedingly more important than all of those things? Loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor trumps all of those things in importance. Amen. Yeah. And I know this is true because Jesus taught that there are weightier and lesser matters in his word. Yeah. It all matters because it's in his word. But some things matter more. And love your neighbor is the chief among commands that matter more. Right. Amen. So please, do to others as you'd have them do to you. Amen. For this fulfills the law and the prophets yeah. and also fulfills Jesus' first sermon on the Mount. Amen. Amen.